Turkey and, and riding into Jerusalem is, is uh, the passage that we're looking at tonight, just looking ahead to that triumphal entry of Jesus coming into Jerusalem, uh, that final week of his life there in Jerusalem. And so uh, heavy prophecy stuff that we're looking at here tonight, some really good stuff about the Lord coming. And so uh, as we begin this third chapter or third part of the book of Zechariah, I just want to kind of remind you um, what, what's going on here. We've looked at some visions in the beginning of the book of Zechariah where we just saw a lot of really wild visions that he received. Of course, the whole idea of, of the visions and the prophecies that Zechariah is receiving is to get the people back into building the temple. They have not been building it for about 16 years. They were frightened off by some people with uh, spears and, and uh, they just went and built their houses instead. And so the Lord is wanting to get them back into building the temple again. And so he's using Zechariah, giving him some visions to encourage them that the Lord is there with them and that he is wanting to help them. He's wanting to fight their battles for them. And uh, if they return to him, he will return to them. And, and so that's the idea behind it. And so uh, for the rest of the book, what we'll look at in chapters 9 through 11 is, is prophecies dealing with the first advent or the first coming of Jesus Christ to the earth. And then in the last couple of chapters, we'll look at uh, prophecies that deal with his second coming. Because, of course, the nation of Israel rejected their Messiah. They didn't accept him as their Messiah the first time he came. And so now we are waiting for that second advent or that second coming of Jesus Christ. And so there are some very, very exciting prophecies in here dealing with the second coming of Jesus Christ as we uh, round out the book. But for tonight, some of the events leading up to Jesus coming the first time, events that were prophesied hundreds of years in advance, and Jesus, boom, 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 fulfilled them one after the other, hundreds of them the first time he came. Uh, and so why do we study prophecy? You know, you think about um, the, the guy that just pronounced that in on, what was it, May 23rd or 21st, that the rapture was going to happen, and now he's put that date off again until October or something, you know. And, and of course, the whole world, the unbelieving world, man, you Christians are a bunch of idiots. What are you doing? Uh, this is nonsense. Of course, we know that the Bible is very clear. We shouldn't be setting dates. But God does want us to be looking for the signs of his coming. Had the Jews been looking for the signs of Jesus coming that first time, they would have been ready for him coming that first time. And so just as the Jews were then, we today are supposed to be looking for the signs of his coming, looking at his word and studying his word and understanding, okay, you know, what needs to happen next? And, and we don't always get it right. Uh, sometimes we get it horribly wrong. And you go back and you listen to tapes and CDs of people that taught 20 years ago, and you think, wow, did they ever miss that one? Uh, and so, you know, we need to be careful when we're looking at Bible prophecy because we can uh, discourage people. We can get people thinking, you know, this is all a bunch of nonsense. And so we don't want to go too far with, um, you know, trying to set dates or any of that kind of stuff. But certainly God calls us to be looking ahead and looking at his word, studying the signs of the times. H.A. Ironside, one of my favorite commentary guys, the value of the study of future prophecy is strikingly displayed in this chapter where we find God through his servant drawing back the veil that hides the coming glory in order that his people may comprehend in some measure their hope that their present path may be in accordance therewith. That's kind of a mouthful, but you get the idea there. We study future prophecy because it really kind of gets us in line with the fact that Jesus is coming and there are signs of his coming all around us. And, and his prophets have laid it out very clearly in Scripture, the things that would be happening around the time that he would come the first time and around the time that he's going to come this time. And so that's why we study it. It's very important that we do. I was thinking about that in light of something that happened to me when I was, I think, maybe third or fourth grade, maybe even younger than that, maybe second grade. I was in Colorado, and Colorado is, is filled with fossil uh, dinosaur graveyard kind of places. There, there just seemed to be a lot of flood deposits in Colorado, especially around the area that I was living. 
And I was in the backyard one day and I, I was just kind of throwing dirt clods and, and throwing rocks and doing things with rocks, you know, a little kid. And, and I broke open a rock and I saw something just like this, a fossilized leaf or a fossilized plant or something like that. And I, I just studied it as a little kid, you know, just thinking, wow, that's amazing. And then I just kind of threw it because I thought it must be pretty common to find stuff like that. Uh, you know, here I just broken up this rock and there it was. And I just thought in my mind, yeah, it must be pretty common to find stuff like that. Well, I don't, I didn't realize until now how rare that is that you can break open a rock and find something like that. But, you know, that made such an impact on my life. And, and any time that I'm out in nature somewhere and I find sedimentary rock, I'm always busting rocks open. I'm always looking for those fossils. I'm always looking for those leaves. It's just something that's carried through with me to that time. Because now I know, what, that those fossils and that sedimentary rock is a picture of what happened in God's judgment as God judged the whole earth for its sin and flooded the entire earth and all of mankind and all of the animals perished because of that. And and any time we find a fossil like that, it's evidence that God did uh, pronounce a judgment on this earth. And so, you know, I I think it's interesting in the light of the fact that you and I as believers, we need to be breaking open those rocks. We need to be looking for the Lord. We need to be looking for his truth everywhere. We need to be looking in his word for the signs of his return, Uh, being diligent about that. The Bible says that uh, those who diligently seek after him will be rewarded if they diligently seek him by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, the Bible says. And so we must study the Bible. We must study Bible prophecy and study the the signs of the times that we're uh, dealing with right now. Of course, you can think about Jesus. That day, he was riding into Jerusalem. Before he came in, he, he sat on that mountainside and he wept over the city because he realized they hadn't been looking at the signs of the time. They hadn't been studying the Bible. They hadn't been studying the book of Daniel. They had not been studying the book of Zechariah that we're studying right now. And they hadn't been looking for that day. When is the king going to come riding into town? When's it going to be? Jesus required them to know the day. He expected them to know the day because it was written in Scripture. Daniel, in, in the 70 weeks prophecy, he laid it out very clearly when the exact day that the Messiah was to ride down that hill on that donkey and ride into town and be proclaimed as their Messiah. And so, you know the story there. We looked at it just recently on the on Palm Sunday. Now as he drew near, he saw the city, he wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Now they're they're gone. There was a set day that, the Messiah would come in. Your king was going to ride into town and, and, and be the reigning king of your nation once again. But you missed it. You missed that day. Um, and so as we um, just get started here, we're going to look at the king of Tyre first. This is a pronouncement of judgment upon the enemies of God's people. And you see there in verse Uh, 1 of chapter 9, the burden of the word of the Lord against the land of Hadrach and Damascus is resting its resting place. For the eyes of men and all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord, also against Hamath, which borders on it, and against Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise. For Tyre built herself a tower, heaped up silver like the dust and gold like the mire of the streets. Behold, the Lord will cast her out. He will destroy her power in the sea, and she will be devoured by fire. Ashkelon shall see it and fear. Gaza also shall be very sorrowful. And Ekron, for he dried up her expectation. The king shall perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. A mixed race shall settle in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. I will take away the blood from his mouth and the abominations from between his teeth. But he who remains, even he shall be for our God and shall be like a leader in Judah and Ekron like a Jebusite. I will camp around my house because of the army, because of him who passes by 
and him who returns. No more shall an oppressor pass through them, for now I have seen with my eyes. Heavenly Father, we do love your word, Lord, and we love your truth. We love the fact that you are coming back soon. And Lord, we do desire to come now and and just uh, get a, a clear glimpse of what you want us to know about that day that you will return and take your people home. So, Father, we do come before you now and ask that your Holy Spirit would lead us, would guide us, and give us uh, just instruction, understanding. Give us the proper interpretation, we pray, so we may not be deceived. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, if you're like me, the first time I read over that, uh, you're thinking, what? What is that all about? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you first read it. There's a lot of history going on here. It's like a history... Uh, report, not necessarily a prophecy. And again, as we looked at the book of Daniel, the critics hate the book of Daniel. And they just assail it with all kinds of, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, and, and this can be proved wrong. Why do they do that? Because they say, look, the things that he's saying right here, there's no way anybody could write that down 300 years ahead of time and then have it come true exactly like it did. There's just no way that that can happen. It's just not possible. And so the same as Daniel, the the critics come against uh, the book of Zechariah in the same way. And they say all the stuff that we've read to this point, chapters 1 through chapter 8, was written by a guy named Zechariah perhaps. And then there's a second guy who wrote the rest of Zechariah years and years later after these events took place. And that's the only way they can explain it away. But, of course, we also know, just like the book of Daniel, that that all these prophecies in the book of Zechariah were translated into Greek 300 years before uh, Jesus walked the earth. We know that for sure, and this book was a part of that translation. And so we know that these things were written before they happened, and they were written very accurately of the coming events that would happen before Jesus walked the earth. And so it's very interesting as we look at it tonight, again, going back over it, the burden of the word of the Lord. And this idea of burden, it's an oracle or a prophecy, uh, a prophecy of wrath, a prophecy of judgment, a very heavy oracle. It's not, uh, you know, light and fuzzy at all. It's just this heavy burden of wrath coming down upon these nations. Of course, these nations are nations that have traditionally been enemies of Israel. They are the nations that are still the enemies of Israel who want to scrape her off into the sea. They're the traditional enemies of the north there. The Phoenicians, the Assyrians, the Syrian, the Assyrians and the Syrians. Uh, and, and today we know it as, as Lebanon and Syria. Those nations that are up just directly north of the nation of Israel today are still in that place of, of wanting to destroy that nation. And so... It's an oracle against them in this time that Zechariah is living because they've been trying to wipe out the nation. These are the people who were trying to keep Jerusalem from rebuilding that temple. These are the nations that are trying to keep uh, Israel from rebuilding the walls around that city so they can protect themselves. These are most likely the people that discourage them from building the temple in the first place. We don't know for sure. Uh, where those people were. But these are the kind of enemies that are right around her, right around the nation there. And so, uh, again, that's why the prophets were required to come out and start pronouncing these things because the people were discouraged. They they felt all these nations around us, they're going to kill us. We can't build the temple anymore. And they became fearful and they didn't trust in the Lord any longer and they stopped building that temple for 16 years. And so, those traditional enemies. God is now pronouncing that judgment upon them. You will be destroyed. Because you did this to my people, because you did not allow them to go back in there and build, because you did not allow them to return and you discouraged them in this way, there's a judgment that's now coming against them. Uh, Damascus, its resting place, being the capital of that area of Syria, for the eyes uh, of all the tribes, all the eyes of men and the, all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord. They're waiting for the Lord to pass this judgment upon them. What's well, interesting, what's being said about Damascus here, that it's going to basically be wiped out. 
you know, many prophecy teachers today and scholars are waiting for a time that the, the city of Damascus may be destroyed. Because of this prophecy here in Isaiah 17, verse 1, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city and it will be a ruinous heap. Well, that has never happened to the city of Damascus. Damascus is the oldest uh, continually inhabited city in the entire world today, to this point. Uh, it's been around longer than any other city continually being inhabited. There are other cities that are older, but you know the people left for a time and then came back. So Damascus, to our knowledge, has never been destroyed as this prophecy here in Isaiah speaks about. It will cease from being a city. And that's an interesting prophecy because, you know, every other city, if it got destroyed in times past, you know, people just re-inhabited. They just built on the ruins of the old city and then there's no problem. But of course now with the nuclear power and uh, nuclear weapons and atomic weapons that we have, we know that when those kind of weapons destroy a city, you don't go inhabit that city again. You go over to Russia, Chernobyl, and, and you look at the cities around there, and they're being inhabited by animals and, and jackals and cats and, and dogs and, and wild animals. There are no people there. People can't exist there. And so those kind of uh, pronouncements, you find them at various places throughout the Old Testament prophecies. Uh, this city will never be inhabited again. And I think the, the reason for that is because it can't be inhabited again. Uh, the city of Damascus, uh, many Bible scholars believe at some point, uh, some war between the nation of Israel and Damascus uh, may break out and, uh, and there'll be a, an atomic weapon lob over there and, and they can inhabit that city ever again, is kind of the idea. But anyway, here's a pronouncement on uh, Damascus and these areas in the north there. But then it begins to... St- to talk about Tyre, the city of Tyre and the king of Tyre. And and so this is a a very interesting city here. A lot is said about it in scripture. It's an area or a city that was uh, inhabited or uh, owned by the the people of the Phoenician Empire uh, that existed uh, around earlier in in history, uh, around the time of the Babylonians and the Assyrians. Early on there, they existed and even before that. But uh, Tyre uh, been around for about 5,000 years uh, as a city. Now, what's interesting about this, this passage that we're looking at right now, it is believed by most Bible scholars that what's being discussed here is, is when Alexander the Great came through this area. The uh, Phoenician Empire had been taken down by the uh, Babylonians and and then the Medo-Persians to some extent. Uh, The Medo-Persians really didn't have a beef with them, though. Uh, The Phoenicians were great shipbuilders, and they built ships for the Medo-Persians, and so they just kind of let them exist there entire and let them build ships for them, and they didn't conquer them in the way that they conquered other nations. Uh, But this city of Tyre was not able to be conquered by the Babylonians or anyone else because it was an island city out off the coast, about a half a mile. And no one could destroy the city. And we'll look at a couple things about that here in a minute. Uh, The Assyrians laid siege against Tyre for five years. This little island uh, capital city of Tyre, off the coast there. But they could not do it. It has 150-foot walls around this little island. And uh, the water in between the the mainland and 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 the island there was about 20 feet deep and you just couldn't uh, you couldn't get to it the sheer walls 150 foot walls were right there on the edge of the island and and so uh, the Assyrians tried for five years couldn't do it Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon tried for 13 years but Alexander the Great came in within seven months he took him out and uh, we'll look at how he did that here in a minute but again the Persians uh, divided the Phoenician uh, area into four different vassal kingdoms. and, and uh, But the only little town of that kingdom that wasn't able to be conquered was Tyre. And so I want to take a few minutes here to look at this thing about Tyre. It's a, it's a judgment against Tyre, against Sidon, though they were very wise. And certainly they were very ingenious people. They came up with the alphabet and a, and a lot of other uh, things that we still use today 
Very ingenious people indeed. They had a great mighty army. And so they had this one last stronghold there on the island of Tyre. And uh, when Alexander came to besiege this island, I already talked about that. We can move on with that. There's another prophecy here that we need to look at. Initially, the the city of Tyre was on the mainland. But then they, uh, after the Babylonian, uh, when they tried to conquer them, they decided to move out to that island. So they packed up all their goods and they moved it onto that island and then built that 150-foot wall out there around that. Uh, But before they did that, Ezekiel prophesied about uh, the judgment that was going to come against Tyre. He says in Ezekiel 26.3, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and will cause many nations to come up against you as the sea causes its waves to come up. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers. I will scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. And we'll look at that in a few minutes. That actually happened. That prophecy was fulfilled by Alexander the Great. As he couldn't get out to that island, he decided, I'm going to take the little city that's left over here, the rubble of that city, and I'm going to scrape it off into the ocean. And he did exactly what you read right here. He scraped it off and made a causeway out to the island so he could get his siege mounts out there and all of his troops out there to to take it out. And so God used Alexander the Great. Well, why is is it such a big deal here within prophecy? Uh, There's a very interesting passage that I want us to look at. If you just hold your place there, turn back to Ezekiel 28. And we see in this passage that it's not necessarily the king of Tyre that's in question here. It's the force that is behind the king of Tyre. The force that is behind the fortress. And and you see there in verse 1, The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, Because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods, in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not a god. Though you set your heart as a heart of a god, behold, you are are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom... In trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. And so truly, the Phoenician people were very industrious. They uh, did a lot of commercial trading because they had a great navy. They were able to go around that Mediterranean sea basin and go to a lot of different ports and, and buy things and trade with people. And so they were very, very intelligent people, uh, very wise, and they became very rich as a result of that. Uh, but you begin to see, if you go over to verse 11, that it's not just this nation that the Lord is speaking to here. It's the force behind this nation. They are a rebellious nation against the Lord as well. And as we looked at the prophecies in the book of Daniel, we understand that all of those kingdoms, the Babylonian kingdom, the Medo-Persian kingdom, the Grecian kingdom, and then the Roman kingdom would be the kingdoms that would uh, be in succession before the Lord came on the earth. And we find this, uh, this nation of Tyre still kind of trying to hang on here. In verse 11, though, we see, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of of fiery stones, and it goes on and on and on. So who do we know that to be? He's talking about Satan here. He's not talking to the the man, the king of Tyre. He's talking to the force that is behind that man, 
behind that kingdom and had been behind that kingdom. He's talking to Satan himself here. Uh, obviously, this king was not in Eden, in the Garden of Eden, and he, he wasn't covered in these beautiful stones and all these things. And so you begin to see there's a spiritual truth that's going on behind this nation, this, uh, this city or nation of Tyre. And so now God is pronouncing a judgment, and that judgment is finally coming to pass, and it will be uh, finally uh, meted out through Alexander the Great, who is going to be used as a tool in God's hand. Well, again, the Phoenicians had become extremely wealthy people because of their exceptional naval power. We talked about that. If you look at a satellite map today of Tyre, you know, the city has been rebuilt to some degree. Uh, it, it is quite a, a fishing port, and, and they do a lot of tourism and things there as well. But you see it today, and it just looks like a little bit of a peninsula that's sticking out there, jutting out there like that. Most of what you're seeing there is the causeway that Alexander the Great built out to the island here. And so you can see in this photo here, this is just kind of a painting of what it might have looked like, obviously. Uh, but the, the land is over here, and then you have a little bit of a half-mile uh, spit in between there. And then the, the walls around that island. Alexander the Great, not able to conquer their, their navy, just decided, I'm going to come a two-prong approach here. I'm going to build this causeway out. So he scraped the whole city off into the sea, made a causeway about 200 yards wide and uh, about a half mile out to the, the island there, and then got his navies involved. And so a two-prong attack, one from the front coming from the land and then the other coming from the sea. And he was eventually, within only seven months, able to take out this, uh, this place that no one else had been able to take out for so many years. So God used Alexander the Great as, a, as an instrument in his hand uh, to bring that destruction upon that wicked nation of Tyre. All right. And then he begins to talk about, um, you see in verse 3 again, Tyre built herself a tower, heaped up silver like the dust, gold like mire of the streets, all that. Uh, behold, the Lord will cast her out. He will destroy her power in the sea. And so you see there, uh, that could either mean you know their power as in their naval power uh, or just the fact that their, their nation was in the sea. A uh, little bit of a, a difference in opinion on what that all means, but it could mean both, you know. They were a powerful, sea-going nation, and they were destroyed in that way. She will be devoured by fire, and, and certainly Alexander the Great burned that, that nation down. And then he begins to talk about the, uh, the people to the south of that region, the south of Israel, the, the traditional enemies of Israel from the south, the Philistines. You remember, if you go through reading the book of Kings and and Chronicles and all that, the Philistines were always that uh, thorn in the side of King David. And uh, and so here they see now the nation of Tyre, a nation that no one else had ever been able to destroy. The Babylonians couldn't take them down. Nobody else could take them down. Now all of a sudden, within seven months, Alexander the Great takes them out. And they're a little nervous now at this point. I would think, you know, they're, they're a little nervous. Uh, they see it and they fear, it says there. Uh, and, and they realize they're next. And certainly they were. They were taken out as well. Now what's interesting, as you go down and you, and you look, it says there's a mixed race. They shall settle in Ashdod. I cut off the pride of the Philistines. Uh, basically just saying he took out the Philistines. Um, even the people that will remain there will become part of the nation of Judah. They will kind of... Uh, just become like the Jebusites who came over and became circumcised and became followers of the Lord as well. But then he says in verse 8, something very interesting. I will camp around my house because of the army, because of him who passes by and him who returns. No more shall an oppressor pass through them. For now I have seen with my eyes. Now, what is being spoken about here? It absolutely came to pass exactly as the history books tell us. Alexander the Great never destroyed the nation of Israel. He never came in and sacked the city of Jerusalem. Uh, it was like there was a wall around it protecting them, and they could not. he could not come in. He didn't want to, and I'll talk about that here in a few minutes. 
Uh, but the Lord, he allowed Alexander the Great to go up and down the coastline because, of course, he's coming up from Macedonia, coming down through Phoenicia and Assyria there. Where's he going next? He's going to Egypt. He's going to go down and conquer Egypt. And always Israel is that uh, pathway that you've got to go through to get down to Egypt. Uh, and so he did. He went, he went back and forth past there, going down to battle with Egypt. But he just would pass by Jerusalem and not destroy Jerusalem. And, and we find that written in the, uh, the chronicles of uh, Flavius Josephus. Josephus writes and tells us exactly what happened with Alexander the Great. And there's a lot of reading here, but it's a really interesting story that I just wanted to impart to you guys. Alexander, when he had taken Gaza, those enemies to the south, made haste to go up to Jerusalem. And Jadoa, the high priest, when he heard that, was in agony and under terror because he had been resisting. Uh, messengers had come to the high priest there in Jerusalem and said, okay, you know, if you just give up, you know, we'll let you become part of our nation. We won't conquer you. Just surrender and everything's good to go. And he said, well, no, I'm not going to. I've sworn my allegiance to Darius over in the Medo-Persian Empire and I I can't give up. I'm going to keep my integrity, keep my word to Darius. I'm not going to surrender. And so uh, Alexander the Great was angry with the high priest there in Jerusalem and was going to come up and and take him out. He was going to wipe him out. Uh, And so he's on the way up there. When uh, when the high priest heard that he was coming, he was in agony and under terror, it says, uh, since the king was displeased at his foregoing disobedience. He therefore ordained that the people should make supplications and should join with him in offering sacrifices to God, whom he besought to protect that nation and to deliver them from the perils that were coming upon them. And so, hey, let's go pray before the Lord. Alexander the Great's coming, and this is not a good situation. I've made him angry. Uh, Let's offer sacrifices to the Lord, and let's really dig in some prayer time here, maybe uh, fast for a little while, uh, because these perils are coming upon us, is is basically the idea there. Whereupon uh, God warned him in a dream, at the end of that time of offering those sacrifices. God warned him in a dream which came upon him after he had offered the sacrifices that he should take courage, adorn the city, and open the gates. And and so it goes in great detail about how he clothed everyone in white and he adorned the city. It wasn't like, okay, we're ready, you know, we're ready to fight and we've got our battle up and, and all that kind of stuff. He just opened the gates to Alexander. And, and everybody came out in white robes and, and they greeted Alexander as he came. That's what the Lord told him to do as uh, told through uh, Josephus here. They opened the gates and, and went out to meet him as he was coming up to destroy the city. When the Phoenicians and the uh, Chaldeans that followed him thought they should have liberty to plunder the city and torment the high priest to death, which the king's displeasure fairly promised them, the very reverse of it happened. And so the Chaldeans, the Phoenicians, all these people that hated the Jews were now on the side of Alexander the Great. And they're like, all right, we finally get to go in there and take out these Jews. We finally get to go in there and wipe them out and we get to torture the high priest and and pull his ears off and all that stuff, you know, they wanted to do. They couldn't wait to get in there. But the absolute reverse happened as they got in there. For Alexander, when he saw the multitude at a distance in white garments, while the priest stood clothed in, with fine linen, uh, the high priest in purple and scarlet clothing with his mitre on his head, having a golden plate on which the name of God was engraved, he approached by himself and adored that name and first saluted the high priest. And so he walked up by himself to the high priest, saw the name of God on the high priest's forehead, and saluted that name, or gave uh, homage to the Lord, basically. He approached by himself, adored that name, and then he saluted the high priest, said hello to the high priest. Now, all the guys that were watching this, back in the back, all of his generals, the kings of Syria and the rest, were surprised at what Alexander had done, and supposed him to be disordered in his mind. Are you crazy? What are you doing? swearing allegiance to the God of the Jews and and now you're saluting the high priest? What are you doing? Come on, we want to destroy these people. 
And uh, they're just shocked. They think he's going crazy or something. He said back to the, his general, I did not adore him to the high priest, but that God who, was honored, who honored him with that high priesthood. For I saw this very person in a dream, who when I was considering with myself how I might obtain the dominion of Asia, exhorted me to make no delay, but boldly to pass over the sea thither, for that he would conduct my army and would give me dominion over the Persians. And now seeing this person in it and remembering my vision and the exhortation that I had in my dream, I believe that I bring this army under divine conduct. So Alexander saw a vision of this priest in the manner that he was coming out to him, doing exactly what he had seen. He realizes now that God has guided him to this place and that God has given him divine conduct and his army to come to this place. And now he's not going to destroy Jerusalem because he realizes where that vision was coming from. It was coming from Jerusalem. It was coming from Israel. And so he feels compelled to honor the God of of that uh, vision that he received. Now, Alexander didn't become a Christian. Let's not go there. I mean, he was pagan and to the core and but uh, it is a pretty amazing thing that's being said here. Now, again, this is not scripture. This is not, this is traditional uh, historical uh, writings here. So we don't know for sure this happened. But, you know, I, I tend to believe the things that Josephus wrote. He was a pretty solid guy. He was a, a Jewish guy that wrote for the Roman government historian. And he did a, a quite a bit of research. Now, what happened next is pretty interesting. He went up, Into the temple, he offered sacrifice to God according to the high priest's direction and magnificently treated both the high priest and the priests. And when the book of Daniel was showed him, wherein Daniel declared that one of the Greeks should destroy the empire of the Persians, he supposed that himself was the person intended and he was then glad. He dismissed the multitude for the present, but the next day he called them to him and bade them ask Uh, what favors they pleased of him, whereupon the high priest desired that they might enjoy the laws of their forefathers and might pay no tribute on the seventh year. He granted all they desired. So what did the high priest ask? He just said, hey, can we keep uh, obeying the laws of Moses? That's all we ask. Just let us keep following God's word. Just let us keep following the laws of Moses and, and uh, not have to pay a tribute to you on the seventh year. And that will fulfill you know, what we want to do here. And so he allowed him to do that. Incredible, incredible thing here. And so you see there in verse 8 again, I will camp around my house because of that army, because of the army of Alexander the Great coming to destroy all these people and take over all these nations. He's encamped around that. The Lord has encamped around that. Uh, he who passes by him and who returns. Alexander the Great never came in and conquered the nation. Pretty incredible stuff. All right, well, uh, moving on through, the rest of it goes pretty quickly. I know you guys are getting a little worried here. Uh, We've only covered eight verses. Oh, no. You guys all right? Okay, let's keep going here. So now we see, not the king of Tyre, not Alexander the Great, but now we're going to see a, a vision of Jesus himself. Uh, a prophecy about Jesus himself riding into Jerusalem uh, as the true king of peace, uh, not as Alexander the Great, a conqueror or anyone else. You see there in verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from river and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of your covenant, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today, I declare that I will restore double to you. For I have bent Judah, my bow, fitted the bow with Ephraim, and raised up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and made you like a sword of a mighty man. 
And so, uh, very clearly, uh, a picture of Jesus coming, the Messiah, coming into Jerusalem that day that we've looked at so many times within the Gospels, that triumphal entry day, that Palm Sunday, where Jesus gets on a donkey and rides down that hill as a, a king coming in peace. And that's the, the kind of the symbol of, of a king coming in peace, not to conquer. A king that would want to come in and conquer is going to be riding a steed, you know, a big horse that's ready for battle, arrayed in battle gear. Uh, he comes lowly, meekly, riding in on a donkey, and that's a sign of a king that's coming in peace, is kind of the idea there. And so, in uh, a couple of things here, prepare the kingdom for your king is, is kind of what I was thinking about. You know, uh, as we look at what John the Baptist, his ministry, was really that that very short period of time right before the Messiah came. All right, guys, get your hearts ready. Get your hearts ready. The Messiah is coming. He's going to be riding into town any day now. Uh, you know, be ready for that. And so that time of, of just calling the nation to repentance. And really leading up until this part, you know, when Daniel wrote his prophecies, he was covering a 400-year period of time, a 400-year period of time where the nations of the world would reign before the Messiah would come. And, and so this idea that now the nation has is, is been allowed to return back to Jerusalem and it's time to get this temple built. You know, we're going to be reestablished as a nation again and your king is coming. And so get the kingdom ready to go here. We don't even have a kingdom at this point. You know, the kingdom is destroyed. The walls are burned down and uh, the, the walls are knocked over. The temple's broken down. All we have here is a, a platform. Let's build the kingdom. Let's get that temple built. We know from a lot of places in Scripture that uh, the temple needs to be built for the Messiah to come. Certainly, we are looking forward to a time where when our Lord returns, that temple will be standing on the Temple Mount there in Jerusalem. And so this idea is get the, get the kingdom up and running and prepared for that king when he comes. Um, a couple of other things we can look at here. I, I just love this idea of rejoicing. Rejoicing, O daughter of Zion. Rejoice. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Your king's coming. You know, and how often do we think about Bible prophecy in, in those terms? You know, uh, we talk about how interesting it is. We talk about how frightening it can be, you know, when we see the signs of the time uh, moving and, and shaping and, and shaking the way they are. And we, we look at what's going on on the news and, and we see our, our um, president, you know, really just kind of throwing Israel out there and saying, hey, let's, let's go back to the pre-1967 borders and, and then let Palestine be a nation, which is a, a, a totally defenseless position for Israel to take. If Israel agrees to that, they're defenseless. Really, they're, they're in a place of, uh, it's not a good place for them to be. And so, you know, we just see again, hey, we got armies to the north, we got armies to the south, and they're wanting to come in once again and take out this nation uh, that the Lord loves and, and is zealous for. And, and we, you know, we get kind of downtrodden about that. We get worried about those things. Uh, I remember years ago there was someone who was coming to our church and I started talking about, you know, the one world order and, and, and different things and, and uh, they got so frightened they didn't want to come to the church anymore. And, and it does put fear in your heart sometimes, realizing that these things are coming to pass. But, you know, for you and I, we really need to just rejoice and rest in that hope that the Lord is coming again. The Lord is coming to take his own with him back to heaven. And that is something to be truly joyful about. Now again, the folks here in Jerusalem at the time that Jesus arrived, they had this verse. They had this verse in their scriptures already. It was, it was firmly established there. Rejoice. Your king is coming to you. He's riding on a donkey. And, and many of them caught that. They realized that that was happening and they began to say, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. But the, the nation as a whole did not go along with that. They didn't realize that their time of visitation was coming that day. But you and I, as we look at Scripture, as we look at future prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled, you and I have 
really got to be in that place of, of rejoicing, looking forward to the return of the Lord and, and just looking for those signs of the times. Not being crazy maniacs about it and going out and saying, the, you know, the end is coming, you know, repent and all that kind of crazy stuff and freaking people out. Uh, we need to be sharing our faith, certainly. But we need to be doing it in a way that, uh, that people can, you know, kind of relate to and, and get on board with and, and not just, you know, you're a bunch of fringe, crazy, religious freaks, you know. I, I think we can share our faith in a way that is relatable, as Paul talks about. You know, if Paul was one of those crazy, fanatical, fringe Christians, how do you reconcile that with what we've been talking about in 1 Corinthians? I will become all things to all people, that by any means I may be able to save some. You know, that's not a crazy, fringe person that's freaking people out. That's somebody that's trying to come to a place of of not compromise on the truth, but how can I relate to these people? How can I relate to this culture? How can I relate to this age group? and and others that I, I don't necessarily have uh, a whole lot of things to relate to them on. You know, how can I come across in a way that doesn't appear to be, um, you know, weird to them? Well, <clears throat> clearly we see here that uh, this is the prophecy dealing with Jesus coming into town. Matthew 21, 2. Go into the village, Jesus told his disciples, opposite you, and immediately you will find a colt tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And then a little bit later on, the writer of Matthew tells us, Matthew himself, tells us that this is the passage in Zechariah that's being referred to here. But it's interesting what Matthew does when he records that. He says, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, a foal of a donkey. What did he leave out there? He left out the line, he is just and having salvation. He is just and having salvation. Why would Matthew leave that out? Well, they did end up going on and rejecting the Lord, many of them. They rejected his justice. They rejected the idea of him reigning over them. They rejected the idea of him being the the just king that would come and, and be king over them. They rejected his salvation. They rejected all of it. And they killed him. And so for some reason, the Holy Spirit saw it necessary to edit that part out when it was repeated at the time of the Lord. I don't know if we can look into that too much, but it's just interesting that it's not found there in the, path, in the passage in Matthew. Well, some other things that we see being cut off here are the implements of war. Had the nation of Israel accepted the Lord... Had they accepted him as the Messiah, they would have had peace. They would have had peace from all those nations around them and that, that reign of the Lord would have taken over from sea to sea, from the river to you know, the, the rest of the land there, the ends of the earth, he says there. He shall speak peace to the nations. Had they accepted him, had they made him the king, had they exalted him to that place, there would have been peace on earth. But they rejected him, and the Lord knew that he was going to be rejected. He says in verse 11, I love that, he says, uh, Because of the blood of your covenant, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. The waterless pit there, some people think it's kind of referring back to when Joseph was thrown into that pit, you remember, and then he was taken captive and taken into the bondage of, of Egypt for so long. And, uh, and then they were set free. Don't really know for sure, but it's just interesting, that idea of the, the blood of your covenant. The blood of this covenant, this agreement that God has made with you. God is going to honor that. He said, you know, if you do this, you'll be blessed more than any other nation. If you, do, if you don't do what I've asked you to do according to this covenant I made with you, you're going to be cursed. And you're going to be, you're going to be scattered like all over the world. But eventually I will honor that covenant. That promise that I made to your fathers, I will honor it and I will bring you back. And that's what he's saying there. Because of the blood of that covenant, I will set your prisoners free. And you know, it's a a beautiful picture of Christ there. Because of the new covenant that you and I have with Jesus Christ right now. That new agreement that we've entered into. Because of his blood being shed on the cross, our sins are washed away. Our sins are cleansed. And he will set us free from our sins. 
He will set us free from that bondage of, of hell and damnation for eternity. But he calls us there to return to the stronghold in verse 12. He calls the people there in Israel, the people that are scattered all over those nations that are still, you know, hey, I don't want to go back to Jerusalem. That's a lot of work back there. You got to rebuild my house and I'll just stay here in Babylon. Return to the stronghold, he says. Come on back to Jerusalem. Help rebuild this nation again. The king is coming soon. Let's rebuild the nation and be ready for him when he comes. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Many of those Jews were in hope, waiting for the Messiah. And, and of course, from this point on, you know, the, the prophecies of the Messiah and, and the ones that have already been given from Isaiah and Ezekiel and the others, you know, they're, they're waiting. Hey, we know our Messiah's coming. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And many of them were, had that hope within them that he would return. Well, it wouldn't be for quite a few hundred years from that point on. But it's still... Uh, I already talked about this, that justice and salvation is coming, but it will be coming later uh, in that second coming. In those chapters we will look at in uh, 12 through 14, he will bring that justice and salvation forever. He's going to bring uh, a peaceful dominion from sea to sea. I've talked about that a little. In uh, verse 13 he says, For I have bent Judah my bow, fitted a bow with Ephraim, just this idea of bending that bow. Judah is like a weapon in my hand. I'm bending that bow back. Uh, The bow is Judah and Ephraim is the arrow is kind of the idea there. Uh, And raised up your sons of Zion against your sons, O Greece, and made you like a sword of a mighty man. The rest of the verses here kind of look ahead to that time when Alexander the Great has now died and he's off the the scene and the nation uh, or the empire of Greece is broken into four uh, different kingdoms. The four generals that were with Alexander the Great basically took over the rest of that kingdom and broke it into four parts. And those guys will eventually start fighting with each other. For generation and generation, they will go back and forth in and out of Israel, conquering Israel, taking it over. Uh, It will change hands many times. And we looked at that in great detail when we went through Daniel. Daniel 11 goes in great detail on that. And so we won't go back over that. But it does look ahead to that time against your sons, O Greece. The sons of Greece, not the nation of Greece itself, was pretty good to the nation of Israel. But the sons of Greece will treat the nation of Israel very, very poorly. And eventually the Maccabean revolt will happen in which they will rise up against those sons of Greece and they will fight against them and win their independence for about a hundred years and they will have peace within the nation again as they conquer uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and these guys that are coming against uh, the nation there. And so that's what the rest of these verses, uh, most Bible scholars point to that and say these are Uh, things that will be leading right up until the time that Jesus comes to uh, the earth the first time there. Then the Lord will be seen over them. His arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will blow the trumpet and uh, go with the whirlwinds from the south. The Lord of hosts will defend them and they shall devour and subdue with sling stones. And that really does look at that idea of the Maccabean revolt. They had... No weapons, really. These weren't men of war. They'd been conquered for hundreds of centuries. They really, they, they didn't have uh, an army to speak of. But they were so sick and tired of, of the things that the uh, Grecian, the sons of Greece, what they were trying to do to them. Of course, we talked about Antiochus Epiphanes coming in there and, and uh, you know, just creating a, an abomination of desolation in the temple where he spills uh, pig's blood all over the place and, you know, just all that stuff. Uh, they just got so fed up with that. They just said, that's it. We're going to fight for the Lord. And, and they just found a courage and they found a motivation to really fight against them. And so with sling stones, they, they just fought those battles. They shall drink and roar as if with wine and they shall be filled with blood like basins, like the corners of the altar. And the Lord their God will save them in that day as the flock of his people and they shall be like the jewels of a crown, lifted like a banner over his land. And again, they had that freedom there for about a hundred years before the Roman government finally came and took over the rest of the world from that point on. For how great is its goodness and how great is its beauty. Grain shall be like the young men 
uh, grain shall make the young men thrive and the new wine uh, the young women. And so that's the end of the chapter, chapter here tonight and we'll just close there. But uh, again, some great stuff coming as, as we see more pictures of Jesus coming, uh, the Messiah coming the first time and the second time as we uh, round out the book there. Hope you guys join us for that. We'll just have a, a time of prayer here tonight. And uh, we encourage you just to stick around and seek the Lord and, and just worship the Lord here for a little while. So let's stand and worship him. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for your uh, prophetic truth, Lord, that just reveals so many different things to us. Lord, we ask that uh, we would just be diligent to continue to study your word with a, a balance of, of, of looking at things in, in the light of what's going on in the world around us and comparing that with what the scriptures are telling us. Lord, we ask for your discernment. We ask for your spirit to just give us wisdom in that way. Father, we ask that uh, you would just place within our hearts a joy in looking forward to the fact that you are coming again the second time, Lord, coming back to uh, take us away from this uh, uh, wicked world. And uh, Lord, we look forward to that day. We praise you here tonight. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.